often were given the opportunity to speak on a topic they were passionate about. So today we're welcoming Hiba Versi to give us a small talk uh, on a topic that she would like to. Can we give her a loud salwat? Are explorations worthwhile? As I stood on the peak of Ben Nevis, I felt a sense of accomplishment of having climbed the tallest mountain in Britain and in awe of how beautiful the surroundings were, are, the feeling of being on the top of the world. This was my exploration, my, th this was my adventure, my exploration. Humans have been fascinated with exploration since the dawn of time. Throughout history, mankind has been driven by an endless curiosity to venture into the unknown, to discover new frontiers, and to push boundaries of what is possible. Exploration has not only shaped our understanding of the world, but has also transformed our societies, economies, and individual lives in profound and meaningful ways. From the remarkable achievement of the moon landing to the conquest of Mount Everest and the exploration of the mysterious depths of the Mariana Trench, these endeavours have captivated our collective, collective imagination and inspired generations. However, these explorations have come with a cost, like we have seen with the Titan submarine. Today, I will talk about if the benefits of the explorations are worth the risks involved. Let us begin with the iconic moon landing on July 20th, 1969. Mankind achieved what was once thought to be a impossible. Apollo 11 touched down on the lunar surface, and Neil Armstrong's famous words echoed across the world. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The moon landing was not merely a triumph for mankind, for, for mankind but a testament to the human spirit. The moon landing was not... not a, the moon landing not only advanced in the achievements in science and technology, but it also had an impact on our minds. It inspired generations to dream big, to strive for the impossible and to explore the unknown. It boosted a passion for science, engineering and space exploration, leading to the advancements that have shaped our world today. I see this every day, either in school or museum, where so many people remain fascinated with space. To me, to me, the idea of space exploration is mind-blowing, especially when I consider that there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on the Earth. The conquest of Mount Everest, the highest peak of, on Earth, was achieved in 1953. This was a test of human endurance, courage, and determination. Countless mountaineers risked their lives facing tetris terrain, extreme weather conditions, and the reduced oxygen of the high-altitude atmosphere. But why do they do it? Is it merely an ego-driven pursuit, or is there something deeper at play? Climbing Everest was, represents a triumph over hu of human, ad human spirit over adversity. It teaches us with per perseverance and dedication, we can overcome even the most daunting challenges. It provides us with a unique perspective of, on our planet, reminding us of its awe-inspiring beauty and need to protect and preserve it for future generations. However, with so many people climbing Mount Everest, pollution and contamination is threatening its beauty. We have to ask ourselves, why are we creating the world's highest garbage dump? Now let us delve into the depths of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the world's ocean. Few have ventured to the Earth's deepest place, where the pressures are immense, the darkness is absolute, and the environment is harsh beyond imagination. But why explore such an inhospitable place? The exploration of the Mariana Trench is expands our understands of Earth's diverse ecosystems and the extremes of life. It unravels the mysteries hidden beneath the ocean surface, revealing new species, geological formations and potential resources. Through this exploration, we gain valuable knowledge that can inform our understanding of the planet and help us address the environmental challenges we face. When we, consider, when we consider if explorations are worthwhile, we must remember that it is not merely about the outcome or practical application. It is about pushing the boundaries of our existence, about fulfilling our innate curiosity and desire to understand the world around us. It is about the pursuit of knowledge and the quest for self-discovery. Human exploration is not without risks or sacrifices. Lives have been lost and resources have been plundered. However, it is through these endeavours we have achieved some of our greatest triumphs. We have expanded our horizons and fostered innovations kindled and kindled a sense of wonder and unity among people from all walks of life.
With any exploration, it should be life-changing for society as a whole rather than just individual. With the moon landing and exploring the Mariana Trench, we have learned a huge amount about the planet and our universe. This has been the case with Everest. However, more recently, that is, it has become a tourist, atta- a tourist attraction for the rich. So, is human exploration worth it? I believe the answer lies within each one of us. It resides in the dream that spark our imagination, the questions that keep us awake at night, and the relentless pursuit that defines our species. It is in our nature to explore, to push boundaries and seek new. Um, today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Kumar Rajani and Professor Sajad Rizvi speaking to us on the life of Wilfred Madlung. Let's welcome them with salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So for those who don't know, Wilfred Mandler um, uh, was a German author and scholar of Islamic history, widely recognized for his contributions to the fields of Islamic and Iranian studies. He was particularly celebrated in Iran for his knowledgeable and fair treatment of the Shia perspective. And uh, his works include the succession to Muhammad in 1997, which many people have, uh, I'm sure around here, have read. Um, we're very fortunate to have two um, esteemed scholars here who will be speaking to us on this topic. Um, and I think we're going to start with uh, Professor Sajjad Rizvi, um, who is very well known to us, having come many times before. Um, Professor Rizvi is an intellectual historian who's interested in the course of philosophy in the Islamic world, both past and present. Uh, he supervises graduate students broadly in Islamic intellectual history, uh, especially in philosophy, theology, and Quranic tafsir. He's the director of the Center for the, uh, Center for the Study of Islam, and we're very, we're not in, he used to be uh, a long time ago, and now he no longer is, and I've got a, an old biography in front of me. So, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and uh, Eid Mubarak to you all as well. Um, it's actually quite apposite to do this on Ghadir, because, you know, Ghadir is, is one of the things that... Um, uh, brings together lots of different groups of people. Um, it's celebrated, of course, by every type of uh, uh, Shia there is. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's um, celebrated by others as well, for whom the uh, Velayat of Amir al is important. So there's, for example, a very big uh, celebration at, um, in Ajmir at the shrine of Muinuddin Jishti, and, of course, in Nizamuddin and many other places, which are not necessarily Shi spaces uh, in South Asia as well. Um, it's also uh, in some ways apposite as a, as a segue because um, uh, Wilford Madlung's um, kind of contribution, I guess, to Shi studies is one which cuts across the different traditions. So he, his earliest work was on Ismaili um, uh, history, uh, early Ismaili history, then he did work on the Zaydis, uh, he did various kind of editions of texts and so forth, um, and uh, then continued working on Ismailis later. Uh, of course, he had an interest in the Ethnashari tradition as well, um, not because of the succession to Muhammad book, I'll come back to that, because that is not, it is not an Ethnashari position. Um, it's often misunderstood, it's definitely not an Ethnashari position for all sorts of reasons. Um, but he did uh, work quite a lot on um, the theological traditions, uh, the imami theological traditions. He was one of the first to talk about the relationship between different Mu'tazili uh, theological traditions and their um, sort of intersection with uh, the classical tradition, uh, starting with um, uh, some of the forerunners of uh, Khaja Nasir Din Tusi and then later Allah Mahilli. Uh, and he was uh, one of the first to also um, write on certain other, uh, you know, quite important figures. Uh, Ibn Abi Jamhul Ahsai, uh, 15th century uh, philosopher, theologian, is a good example. Uh, as is Abdul Razak Lahiji, a 17th century Safavid thinker. So, uh, you know, his contribution was across the board. Um, in terms of my own kind of... Uh, interactions with with him. I think I first met him probably about 94. Um, and then when I was an MPhil student, I, I did a couple of classes with him. 
to be perfectly honest, the classes were terrible. Um, uh, because he, he was not someone who engaged. So all we did, there, was, there were literally, there were three of us, um, Toby Mayer, myself, um, Peter Starr. Um, Peter Starr was working on, on what's known as Christian Kalam, so sort of 10th century Arabic Christian theology. Uh, Toby was doing his dissertation with Madlung on Avicenna, and I was just an MPhil student who basically wanted to come along and have a, and see what was going on. And we just sat around reading the text and translating. And now and then when you'd ask him, you know, maybe we should discuss this, he'd say, well, if you have anything to discuss, write it down and, and leave it in my pigeonhole and I'll mark it. And I was like, I'm not interested in you marking anything. But um, he wasn't the most engaging teacher in that sense. Um, but as a supervisor, um, he, he was and he could be very tough as an examiner. So many years later, I didn't do my PhD with him um, because after about five years, I think I was sick of Oxford, so I, I left. Um, if I had stayed, I probably would have had him as my supervisor. Um, but later, he was my, uh, one of my two examiners. And in fact, my viva was in his flat, which was um, a typical kind of rather austere sort of German space. Um, there wasn't really much there uh, that you could kind of talk about. Um, and, and he really grilled me, and he grilled me on things which I'd said passing in my dissertation, which were of no real relevance to the main topic, uh, but they were relevant to his personal obsessions. So I think somewhere I, I talked about um, Shahristani, the famous 12th century theologian, and I'd used, I think, the word Ash'ari alongside his name, and he said, well, of course, everyone knows Shahristani was Ismaili. And I said, well, fine, I'll correct that. It's not really important. But he wanted to discuss this. And I was like, I really don't care. This is not important to my dissertation at all. Um, but, and he could also be um, remarkably pedantic on Arabic. So uh, a number of places he sort of said, well, this translation doesn't seem to work. And I said, well, literally, you're right. But I think functionally, this works. Um, and he was, of course, not having it. So he said, no, just change it. Um, so he wasn't terribly, um, he wasn't creative in that way that others now in the field, I think the field has moved on. He had that kind of, I think, rather old fashioned approach to how you deal with texts. And how you deal with texts was in a fairly um, transparent manner in which one word, for example, in Arabic had to be broadly rendered by one word in English. And of course, we know that's complete nonsense. It's just not possible to do that. Um, at the same time, what was also quite good about him was that he, um, you know, over the years, he'd had lots of really interesting PhD students. And his attitude was he would take on a PhD student uh, because he wanted to learn about a particular area. Um, and he had, you know, some very prominent students who were, knew far more about the topic than he did. I mean, one very good example is Hussein Mudarisi. Um, who was a student of his um, early on when he'd moved to Oxford. Um, and, um, you know, he said himself, he never taught uh, Mudarisi anything, but he learned quite a lot from him. Uh, and that was the case with others who worked on, for example, in later years, he was very much interested in, in Ibadi theology, which of course is um, one of the major sort of theological schools in, in present day Oman. Um, and he had a number of Ibadi students um, from whom he probably learnt more, certainly in the initial phrases, than, um, than he necessarily taught them. Um, so, and, and he could be very open. So if you, if you invited him for a talk, he would almost always say yes. He'd get invited to Iran all the time. He used to get invited to Iraq. Um, he never went in the end because by that point he was already quite old. Travelling was a bit more difficult. But I, I remember a number of times he said, you know, I'd love to go because um, he, one of the things about him was that he'd been a, um, the cultural attaché in Baghdad back in the 1950s. Uh, that was one of his, uh, I think that was his first job uh, before he did his PhD. Um, so he had this kind of uh, affection for Iraq, um, which, was, which was quite striking. Okay, um, enough of the reminiscences because I guess we should, we're moving on to time. Let me just uh, say a couple of things about his 
um, other elements of the work. So um, I think his work on, on Zaydis is really important. Um, his first, well, his second book, but his first kind of famous book is on um, the early Zaydi Imam, um, Al-Qasim ibn Ibrahim al-Rassi, and on the, the development of, of Zaydi theology in the early period. And in particular, the, uh, I guess the bifurcation of, of Zaydi theology into two trends, uh, which um, you know, are normally called Jarudi and um, Hadawi. Um, Jarudi, broadly speaking, um, sorry, uh, Jarudi, Jarudi and Batri. And Jarudi, broadly speaking, means, I guess, a bit more radical. Um, so the Jarudis are the basically the Rafida of the Zaydi tradition. Um, they are very clear that the early three Khulafa are Kuffar, for example. Um, and they are very clear that uh, certainly the Ahl al-Kisa are Ma'asum. Um, and they have a fairly maximalist positions on the Imamate. Uh, the Batris, on the other hand, are, are considered to be the liberals, the, modern, the moderates in this. Now, the book is actually not just about the classical tradition, and he even talks about, he talks about the, the interaction with the, uh, the Mu'tazili tradition, so much so that the real um, survival of the Mu'tazili tradition after around the, the 12th century uh, in the world of Islam is amongst the Zaydis. Um, uh, that's that's um, incontrovertible. Uh, in fact, the standard kind of tabaqat al-Mu'tazila, the kind of biographical dictionary of Mu'tazili thinkers, is written by a 14th century uh, Zaydi figure. Um, but alongside the Mu'tazili kind of interaction and the sort of cross-fertilization, he does also mention people who are very critical. So one of the first places I came across the mention of someone in the 14th century called Sayyid Humaydan ibn Yahya, um, there is a collection of his, his treatises in the British Library, and it's been published as well. So Sayyid Hamidan is, uh, is an interesting person because he is very anti-Mu'tazili, but he is uh, very much a uh, sort of a, a Jarudi, Hadawi, um, a Zaydi. So, so, and, and also he, he edited texts about the Zaydi tradition in Yemen in particular, uh, and those contributions are really important um, because Generally speaking, within uh, the study of Islam, the Zaydi tradition is, is very much uh, neglected. Uh, and this is why, um, particularly with the situation in Yemen in the last 20 years or so, uh, with the Houthis, um, a lot of people have very little sense of what's going on, and they don't really understand where this group emerges from and what their positions are and their theology. Um, but, uh, of course, um, if they'd actually bothered reading anything that Madeleine had done before, they would actually understand precisely where, where this tradition was coming from. Um, last thing I'll say quickly is about the succession um, book. Now, I remember, um, so the book came out somewhere towards the end of the 95, 96 academic year, and just before it came out, um, uh, Madeleine gave a, a seminar at, um, at the Oriental Institute. It used to be still called the Oriental Institute. They just only just changed the name to, I think, Asian and, Asian and Middle East Studies uh, very recently, um, just as Cambridge has done as well. Um, and he gave a, a, a seminar about the book, and it was a typical kind of Oxford seminar. I think there were mainly eight people there. Um, and uh, most people were, were kind of skeptical. Well, there, there are two kinds of people who are skeptical about the book. Um, there's, there's, there was one kind of person which was then reflected in a review written in the Times Literary Supplement who basically dismissed Madlung as someone who was basically gullible, who believed whatever the Muslim sources says and didn't have any critical approach to them, which was fundamentally a mistaken characterization of him. Uh, and so they were like just not convinced. They said, well, this sounds too she. Um, and then there were a few Sunnis there who were obviously very upset um, because this went against their, their both confessional and their academic approach. Um, and they kept on saying, yes, but this can't possibly be the case. And the Quran can't possibly be saying that. 
Um, now, the, the basic position he puts forward in succession is twofold, and I, I'm not going to say much about it because I assume you know, yeah, and a lot of you have read it. One is to say that the Quran presents a particular idea about succession within um, blood lineages. Um, and so uh, his point is that if we take the Quran seriously on this, then clearly the succession should have been in the lineage of the Prophet, uh, or certainly in the family of the Prophet. Um, and, um, and that's interesting because he, he considered the Quran to be a historical document. And I do remember um, a very strange uh, conference back in 2010 in Madrid where he was one of the three kind of old guys who were asked to sum up what had happened in the conference. And the conference was actually on takfir, so it was a bit different. And um, his summing up comments, he didn't mention anything about the conference. His whole summing up was like, but what if the Quran is true? <laughs> Which is an interesting question. But what he actually meant by that is not whether it's true for him, but whether, like, is, you know, academics have to take the Quran seriously because people do believe it to be true. So, so, you know, there's a particular attitude that you should have to the text in that sense. And the other part of uh, the, the case was basically um, a, what I would say, a broadly Zaydi argument for succession, right? So the difference between a Zaydi and an Ismaili, um, Ithnashari approach to uh, the imamate is that in the latter, the imam is ma'asum, he is appointed by nas, by designation, and um, he is an imam whether he has power or not. Um, that much is very clear. Amongst the Zaydis, that's not the case. Amongst the Zaydis, the imam always has to make a claim for the, for the imamate. And it's, it's quite clear that, um, uh, you know, for him, um, obviously, Amir al-Mu'minin is an imam because of the blood connection and also because he makes a claim for it. And of course, for him, Imam Hassan is not an imam because he, as Madlung famously put it, was not terribly interested in his father's uh, political ambitions. Um, and uh, there are all sorts of other kind of elements of that which make it very clear that it's actually fundamentally a Zaydi case which he's making. And, and it's just a bit surprising that most people didn't really spot this at the time and it took ages for until people actually pointed this out uh, a lot later. So, um, you know, in some ways, a succession has been a runaway success. You know, um, it, it, it won the Kitab Esal in Iran, um, which um, is always a, a political act. Um, uh, having been nominated twice and not having won, <laughs> I can tell you it's, it's, it's always political. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, he was very much fettered in, 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 in Iran, and I think he won at least a couple of prizes um, after that as well. Um, and there is, a, there is a Persian translation which actually corrects many elements of what uh, Madlung does. Uh, the, the Iranians have a habit of translating texts and correcting them. Um, and that's true of uh, Madlung's work. It's also true of Hussein Madarisi's work and, and various others. Um, so... Hmm? I mean, the fascination with Iqbal is something which I never understand because I personally don't like Iqbal, but that's a different matter. Um, but um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in some ways, I guess the succession is, is going to be the source of Madlung's infamy. Um, but you really, I think, a better judge of him as a scholar would be the Dar Imam um, Al Qasim ibn Ibrahim book, which has never been translated to English and probably should have been translated at some point because it's a wonderful introduction to, to the Zaydi tradition. Um, and I think I'll st I've already spoken for far too long, so I'll hand over to, uh, to Kumail. Thank you very much. And uh, now we're very f fortunate to have Dr. Kumail Rajani, who's a, who uh, I think is a postdoctoral post research fellow in Islamic studies at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. Uh, he works on the Law, Authority, and Learning in Shia Islam project uh, and um, uh, primarily focused on the origins and development of the Hadith corpus. Um, uh, his research studies also include uh, Islamic law, legal theory, and Shia studies more broadly. Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
uh, Eid al-Ghadir Mubarak to each and every one of you. Uh, such a joyous occasion. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, uh, and intimidating as well, because I'm sitting next to my supervisor, uh, along with uh, Professor Gleave, who was supposed to be here. So Professor Gleave and Professor Jadriz, we both were my supervisor for my uh, thesis. Uh, so, yeah. I would uh, like to discuss about uh, life of Professor Madeleine in five uh, areas. So, biography and academic background, which I assume we all know by reading what's uh, uh, Wikipedia pages. Uh, the second part would be his expertise and specialization, his research interest, contribution and impact on academia and communities, and finally, my remarks and observations. Um, as I said, I'm not going to uh, delve into uh, his biography and academic background. A uh, couple of points uh, um, uh, has already been discussed. Um, when it comes to his expertise and specialization, primarily he is interested in Arabic language and literature. And for that reason, for 20 odd years, uh, he held the esteemed chair of Lodian uh, professorship in Arabic uh, language and literature. Uh, so when Professor Sajjad says about uh, him being pedantic, uh, that's because uh, of his philological approach throughout his works. Uh, if you compare Madelung with Vanes and other intellectual historians, you see clear distinction where Madelung is more um, pedantic and like he would stick to the words and he would be very careful, he would pick people like why that person has translated this and that because his primary focus throughout his career has been in, uh, in, in these words and how to translate. I will give a couple of anecdotes towards the end of uh, this session as well. Uh, as far as his uh, works are concerned, um, they focus uh, primarily on uh, formative period, classical period, and medieval period. You don't see anything from him, to the best of my knowledge, from contemporary history or like, you know, contemporary period, he's simply not interested in it, right? Um, even like, you know, medieval, there are just like a couple of works which we could uh, see uh, in which he's not that strong compared to how he comes across very powerful, uh, very critical in formative and classical uh, periods. Uh, when it comes to his research interest, um, as uh, we already discussed about like, you know, Zaydis uh, and other groups, uh, I have put this in inverted commas, uh, that he's particularly interested in marginal tradition. Um, once upon a time, these uh, disciplines, these areas of studies used to be considered as marginal traditions and due to his efforts and like, you know, other scholars, now it's not on periphery. Any scholars, Sunni or Shia, whoever would be discussing like, you know, early Islamic period, early Islamic intellectual history, Shiism has to be discussed, Ibadism has to be discussed, right? And that's because of seminal contribution of Madelung and others. So you'd see uh, he has discussed dwellers, um, which we have critiqued just now, Zaydis, uh, Ismailis, which I will be touching in a while, Ibadis, uh, Mu'tazila, uh, and Khawarij, and so on and so forth. Um, as far as his research interests are concerned, um, you would see loads of uh, edited texts as opposed to monographs, right? Even when he starts analyzing and delving into intellectual history, he doesn't seem to be that much strong, as much strong as he is in editing text and being particular about how to read manuscripts and how to uh, edit it with full uh, loyalty and faithfulness. Um, he has done throughout his careers, he has done like, you know, lots of edited texts. One of this, which is the advent of the Fatimids, Kitab al Munazarat, which I will be discussing in a while. This picture of Professor Madeleine has taken uh, by me in 2013 um, in his uh, Ismail Institute old office, uh, Houston Square, right? It used to be there, yeah. So that's in, um, well, um, the, from 1999 onwards, he used to have the senior research fellowship in uh, position in, in Ismail Institute. And there he has done a lot of uh, khidma and service to um, the imam and, and the Ismaili setup. 
So, Kitabun Munazarat as a case study which I want to discuss um, in this session. Kitabun Munazarat essentially is a uh, Fatimid text uh, before the advent of the Imam, uh, Ismaili Imams. So, uh, Fatimid um, Empire established, Fatimid dynasty established in 290. Kitabun Munazarat is compiled or written by Ibn al Haytham who is supposed to be born around 273, 274 um, after Hijra. So you see, there is a gap of like, you know, almost uh, 17, 18 years before the advent of the Fatimids in North Africa. So this is a very important text, not only for Ismailis, but for entire uh, Islamic civilization or like, you know, Shi intellectual history. Um, from this book, particular text, we would be able to identify key elements um, and we would be able to understand how certain ideas started floating in Baghdad. So I'm interested in like migration of texts and ideas across different times and regions. Uh, so particularly the reading Kitabul Munazarat, we would be able to identify if certain ideas were floating in Baghdad, which is a later period, I mean 12 Baghdad period, later period, and you see quite good connection with early North African period, right? So let's make it very clear. This is Ghaybat Sugra, right? Um, when Kitabul Munazarat has been written. It's not in Medina, Baghdad, Kufa, or Qum, where she centers are located. This is in North Africa, right? So the question would beg like how this text reached to North Africa and the North African contribution uh, to Shiite intellectual history would be immense based on what we glean from this particular work. Let me give you a couple of examples. So Ghadir is very much highlighted, right? So our very first book in Shia tradition, Twilight tradition is Al-Kafi, right? Before that, Al-Baraqi and like, you know, um, so on and so forth. So if you were to look at this Hadith material, we don't have an early return source which is available at our disposal. Of course, there were like non extant text available there, but we don't have at our disposal at this stage, right? Our very first books are like from Barkin and Kulaini. Kitabul Manazarat comes at an early period. So an Ismaili text before a Twilight text. So Ghadir is very much highlighted over there. I don't want to quote, it's, it's the day of Ghadir. We would have discussed this, uh, but I assume uh, there was a celebration uh, last night. Um, the tragedy of the house of Fatima, that's something which is mentioned in Kitabul Manazarat. And sometimes like we struggle and like, oh, the very first person, the very first scholar who mentioned this was Sheikh Al-Mufid and Ali Rishad. But Sheikh Mufid comes much later. This is something in North Africa much earlier in Ghaybat Sugra, right? Um, I'll be quoting a couple of passages from uh, Kitab al uh, just to mention how Madelung's contribution enhanced our understanding of early period, right? If these texts were not edited with this meticulous observation and, and various footnotes, we would have never reached to these conclusions or we would have never identified the links between North Africa and Baghdad. Uh, Najul Balag is another example. Um, couple of like uh, sermons from Najul. Najul Balag is always under question, right? In terms of his authenticity. So couple of um, sermons or letters are identified in North Africa. And we know for a fact because of Kitabul Munazarat, which Madelung has uh, introduced and, and, and edited. Um, uh, in Kitabul Munazarat, there is a character named, um, not character, I mean, he's a esteemed scholar of that period, Dai Malusa. He is the figure uh, very much involved in the letter uh, to Malik Ashtar of Najul Balaga, letter number 53. So again, the contribution of Dai Malusa is quite visible. Um, and if we were to struggle to find like, you know, uh, references for Sharif Razi's Najul Balaga, you may find in North Africa in the works of um, Dai Malusa or like Qadi Noman in his uh, Kitab al uh, Third testimony of Adan, we all know that Sheikh Saduk mentions in his Al-Faqi, so may Allah curse Mufawada who have introduced in Adhan Ashadu Anali. So one would wonder like, you know, how come Sheikh Saduk is so furious and to whom he is referring, right? 
and you would find uh, references of these practices in North Africa. So I wonder, I put this question mark, I wonder, is there any connection? Sheikh Saduk might be referring to Ismailis, early Ismailis, who were in these practices uh, um, with um, very much uh, support and uh, anti-Sunni sentiments in North Africa. So give, let me give you a couple of examples from Kitab al uh, uh, the offense um, and the assault against uh, Fatima Zahra, salamu alayha. So Kitab al page number 69, um, you see sufficient as an offense is their assault against a Zahra, Fatima, the daughter of the apostle of God, and the blocking of her inheritance, the taking away of what was in her hands, of the gifts of her father, and his presence to her, and the repudiation of her testimony. Page number 70, the companions signified by the stars are the family of Muhammad and whoever followed them in doing good, such as Salman, Miqdad, Abu Dhar, Ammar, Hamza, Jafar, Ubaidullah ibn Harith, and others like them. So he's indicating like, you know, when Sunni says, Ashabi, Kan Nujum, these are not like, you know, genuine ashab. Genuine ashabs are these people. I'm not reading a 12 text, by the way. Let me be very clear. This is in Ghaibat al-Sugra, not in Kufa or Qom or Baghdad. This is in North Africa, right? And Ismaili writing these, text, these uh, words. These are the uh, Siddiqun, veracious and true witness before the Lord, and there is the reward and the light. Claiming the imamate and the leadership ahead of God's friends in taking away the veil of Fatima, the mistress of uh, all the women in creation, Sayyid the Tunisa al-Alameen, belongs among the major sins which cannot be expediated but constitute polytheism. Right? So you, you could see the level where he's going. That nullifies any merit and which will not be forgiven. Um, this is particularly, it's a bit longer, but just indulge with me. I, I think um, he makes a point over here, uh, which is quite interesting, uh, which is whole on the concept of bara, tabari, tawalli and tabari, in indo culture we say tawalla and tabara, right? So next he spoke, this is Dai Malusa speaking to Ibn al-Haytham and like Marwazi and other scholars as well. Next he spoke about dissociation, bara. But I did not respond to him and said, in regard to those who have died, there is no need for us to mention of them their evil acts, nor even their good uh, ones. He said, uh, and this is referring to Abu, uh, Abu Abdullah Shi. not so until you know the superiority of those you accept as leaders, i.e. imams, and the wickedness of those whom you regard as enemies. Then he discussed with me dissociation for 30 days. So the concept of tabari, tabara, has been mentioned for 30 days in this context. At the end he said to me, do you see that you must consider someone who steals this clothes of yours and robs you of this ledger as unjust and as a wrongdoer, must impunge him and not accept his testimony? I said, yes, certainly. He said, you treat the person who stole clothes from you with a value of two dinars as a wrongdoer, and yet you desist in regard to someone who violated the religion of God, repudiated the sunnah of the apostle of God, assumed power over the friends of God, tore aside the veil of Fatima, daughter of God's apostle, canceled her inheritance, took away what was in her hands as a gift from her father, the apostle of God, murdered her, killed her infant of hers in her womb. So this is the first reference we see of like Hazrat Mohsin here in Shi context, right? If you were to consider Ismailis together. So Sheikh Mufis Ali Rishad is a later work, right? Compared to this. Um, but whenever we discuss like, you know, with the Shi'i circle, we don't refer to this Ismaili text. Um, and that's something, and, and uh, in, 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 in continuity, uh, like he wept and I wept and, and um, the whole thing of Masaib um, arose. Is this indicating it's end of time? It's not moving. <laughs> I mean, so. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, okay, what are his contribution and impact? So, as I said, I want to get into the details, introducing and editing early texts. And addition of these early texts plays a critical role in shaping our understanding of early history. If these texts were not edited or like, you know, introduced to us, we might not be able to look at history as we are looking now. Um, there are like a couple of uh, names which I don't want to mention over here. Now, another contribution, he has inspired uh, uh, I mean, generation of like new researchers and uh, new research area. So uh, Professor Gleave and like Professor Sajjad are like, you know, first generation of, uh, um, I mean, examiners of um, uh, their thesis. 
for me, um, he was someone who inspired me to write my thesis. So this is uh, my picture with him in 2013. Um, I met him in the Ismail Institute. He wrote an article in 1976, before I was born. So you know, you know my age as well. So um, I told him, like, um, he wrote an article which is mentioned, um, the whole, uh, it's on Kitabul Ida of Qadi Oman, again in, in North Africa. Um, a book in which we have early sources from the companions of the Imams, likes of Haris bin Abdullah Sejistani, likes of Ubaidullah uh, bin Ali al Halabi, right? likes of Muhammad bin Ali al Halabi. So, in this article, it's, it's a short article of 18 pages, he lists early works of the companions of the Imams, I mean Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was some and later Imams. And I was fascinated, it's just 18 pages. I said, like, there is a lot of work to be done in this context. Right, um, and he was like skeptical. He said, like you know, I've exhausted my resources, and like you know, I found this, and nothing more could be done in that regard. And I said, like I want to take up the challenge and work um, in this uh, area. Um, and I developed the whole thesis, which uh, Professor Jad has, like you know, he used to read and 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 um, mark and 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 point out, like you know, uh, various his comments and and uh, feedback on it. That's the full thesis just developed on one article which he wrote before I was born. So you see, this is just one example. I mean, you know, there are examples and examples in which he has inspired both students as well as um, uh, research areas. Uh, final remarks and observation. One question which we get asked uh, in community members, oh, he, if he knew a lot of things about like Shiism, so why he didn't become Muslim? And why he didn't become Shia? Um, and that's like typical, whenever I was like, you know, in Iran, any scholar would come from West, they would ask this question, like, you know, why he didn't become uh, Shia? So we need to identify, like, you know, when scholars in academia, when they study these texts, they don't study from the perspective of faith. These are history for them. This is an intellectual history for them, right? They are interested in exploring ideas of like what happened in early Islamic period, in a formative period. That's it, and full stop, nothing more than that, right? So it would be too naive for us to expect that by reading all these things in a much more nuanced and sophisticated manner, they would be inspired to change their religion. So that's not the case, uh, which we should uh, bear in mind. He was extremely passionate about research. At the age of 91 years uh, old, he edited um, the two texts from Abu Abdullah Shi and his brother Abu Abbas affirming the Imamate. It just published just two years ago. It shows how passionate he was about, like, of course, it's replete with errors, and I'm writing a book review on that, but that's how it works, right? Because he has inspired a generation of scholars uh, to critique, and uh, this is how it would work. Uh, so just wait for my book review on affirming the Imamate in the next couple of months. Um, this meticulousness, uh, Sajjad, I would consider to be pedantic, but I come from that background, so I value the sort of like, you know, philological arguments, and he would be very particular whenever you see him. He's like, oh, you come from Exeter, remind to that your colleague, in one of his books he wrote, Beh Bahani, it's Bih Bahani, not Beh Bahani. I mean, who would care? Like, once it's published, uh, no one would be, but it has occupied his mind, all right? To the extent, I'm not the author. And I have nothing to do whatsoever with that person. I'm not his representative as well. Um, Hassan Ansari wrote something, um, and like he just blasted, um, picking up like this, there is a typo over here, this is like not, not written particularly, like you know, there is a passive orthographical error, and so on and so forth. So these are like, you know, senior scholars, and like um, uh, people like me like to benefit from each and every angle, from his meticulousness, from his passion about research, and whatever he had to offer to uh, Islamic intellectual history. Thank you. Salat. So two fascinating um, insights into the life of Professor Madlung. Um, we do have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, any questions from either side? Thank you very much. Uh, so that's why did he give you major corrections or <laughs> you were lucky? 
Uh, no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, uh, the corrections he gave me, I already spotted them. So I, I think I, <laughs> I sent them in like the next day. Okay. No, I think uh, from a broader point of view, as you have pointed out, he was probably instrumental in starting a tradition of Shia scholarship amongst the Western scholars. And uh, before that, it was really, I remember in the 70s, very difficult to see any text really going into these aspects uh, in detail. So we can give him credit for that, which is true. Now, what will be the difference between the Zaidi and Ibadi traditions? Uh, so, so obviously the, the Zaydis are um, uh, a group of Shia. Um, so they do uh, hold that the Imam has to be, um, you know, a descendant of the Prophet and has to um, uh, claim to be the Imam and actually has to um, uh, wield power. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the phrase they use is that they, he has to rise with the sword. Um, the Ibadis, uh, broadly speaking, come out of a tradition which we normally call Khariji. So they come out of the, the Basran tradition. Um, and although, of course, the Ibadis nowadays especially are very keen to emphasize that they are not Khawarij. And uh, they do not come from that. Um, what is actually interesting, and, and Madlung noticed this, and, and it's, it's becoming fairly well known, is that the the intellectual circles from which the Ibadis emerged. So, uh, someone like um, uh, Abdullah Al Fazari, whose works uh, Madlung edited in uh, from Kufa. So both in the figures in Kufa and in Basra were in very close communication with the early Mu'tazila, the kind of even the proto Mu'tazila, as well as a number of Shi figures. So, for example, Fazari was. Um, uh, was quite close to um, Hisham ibn al-Hakam um, and, and various other kind of figures who are, are certainly considered to be Shi uh, figures in, in Kufa. Um, but the Ibadis, broadly speaking, uh, would are, are definitely not Shia. And um, their traditional theology is um, actually quite anti-Shi uh, and certainly very hostile to Amir al-Mu'minin. Um, and that is a clear kind of remnant of the fact that they do come out of those circles which are broadly uh, Khawarij. So, Abdul Rahman Salim and Madlan has edited like literally tens of treatises uh, published by Brill, right? Yeah. yeah, on Ibadi text, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I just have two questions. So, why was Wilfred Madelung interested in Islamic history in particular, like in like the realm of history? Um, and then also, like you said, he wasn't a Shia or a Muslim. So, was his conclusion about the succession of the Prophet based on the fact that like this is what Muslims believe to be true, or like is it hinged on that basis, or is it like? on another conclusion or? So actually towards the end of his life, um, well actually not even the end of his life, he said this for the last 20 odd years. Um, he believed that the successor to the Prophet was Fatah the Zahra salam, which is not a normative Shi position, right? Um, and um, you know, he, and he would have said, well of course because Arab society didn't work in that way. It wasn't possible, and she obviously she passed away very soon after the Prophet. Uh, but for him, she is the Imam after the Prophet, and then of course, then like in her lineage. Um, now, so he came from a particular tradition of German Orientalism in which um, they were trying to you know, fundamentally make sense of what's going on in the historical record. And because he was taking the Quran seriously as a historical source, and his reading of the Quran was this is how succession should work in an Islamic context. So he's making a certain kind of normative claim in that sense. Um, he's not saying this is 
what Muslims believe or this is what the Shia believe or this is what Zaydis believe. He is probably saying, well, this is what we can understand from the historical record and normatively this is what should have happened. Um, and, and the fact that it, as I said, um, coincides with the Zaydi position, I think is not a coincidence given that he worked extensively on Zaydis as well. So he pro almost definitely would have come across the similar kinds of arguments in the works of Al-Hadi and others. In terms of the first question, like why he was interested, I mean, I see a pattern in his work, as I mentioned in one of the slides as well, what I like to call it like, you know, in early 60s and 70s, 1960s, 70s, marginal tradition, like likes of work which is done, like on Akhbari as well, Akhbari as well, and Khawarij, Ibadi. So all these things are like on periphery of what used to be in that time Islamic intellectual history. So uh, certain people have this temperament, right? Like, you know, the things which are like undiscovered, let's explore. So I, I think it comes from that sort of like temperament. Actually, a good example of that is um, a work that was published, I think, in the late 80s based on a series of lectures he gave at Columbia, which is called something like, um, I think, Trends in Islamic Thought in Iran. So he was looking at Iran in the early Islamic period. And most of the case studies are not what we would nowadays call Sunni. Mm -hmm. um, and even if they are in a Sunni context, they're certainly now, not nowadays considered to be sort of normatively Sunni as well. So um, I think there is an element of, of maybe the exotic uh, going on there as well. And, and it could also just be the, the f it was his, his actual experience. I mean, he, as I said, he spent that time in Baghdad. Um, he knew a number of, of very important kind of Iraqi intellectuals from that period. Um, so I think there could potentially have been some sort of influence there as well. Last question, anyone? Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, sort of a follow-up question to that, but um, did he profess a faith at all? Um, do we know anything about that? So as far as I know, I don't think he did believe in any particular tradition. Um, I mean, some of his students like Zabina Schmidtke are Christian of a particular persuasion. Um, so she's actually a, a Christian scientist, which is a strange tradition to adhere to. Um, and he certainly, uh, you know, came out of a, uh, you know, what's known as a kind of a pietistic Protestant background, but I don't think he was ever really religious at all. But there, there was a service held for him, like in yeah. Cathedral, yeah. I, I mean, so, he's a fellow of St. John, so. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a completely an opposite example of what happens, like, uh, perhaps we don't know about, like, his religiosity, but there was service conductor, and I would end with this anecdote in Qom, so uh, in Masjid Imam Hassan Askari, which is like a famous mosque in, like, uh, in Qom, so a scholar was like, you know, giving a sermon and he said like, you know, whatever you want to recite, like zikr and adhkar and durood, do it when you are alive. After you're dead, nothing is gonna happen. People are not going to recite for you. And then he started giving this uh, example. He said like, one of my friends who passed away in Iran-Iraq war, you know, in 1970s, um, and then, he was da'im with dhikr. So always he used to recite, Ashadu la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. When he passed away, in the janazah, normally people recite la ilaha illallah or salawat, right? In his janazah, people were chanting, Mark bar America, Mark bar America. <laughs> so, because, you know, the Iran Iraq war and like, you know, dead to America, that's like quite normal in there. So what he meant to say is like, after you die, no one is going to take care of la ilaha illallah, right? So if you want to recite, recite when you are alive. So, yeah, so that's quite opposite to what happened with him, like, with uh, Professor Madeline. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. There is one more question, if I may. Um, do we know about his, uh, the period in Baghdad uh, in the early 50s? Did he interact much with any notable figures that might have impacted his attitude in Najaf? that we know of? I, I mean, that's a good question. I, to be honest, I don't know about Najaf. Um, I, th I mean, he definitely uh, knew people who were at Baghdad University uh, and who were in Baghdad. Uh, I'm sure he would have been to Najaf. But like, for example, I don't think there's any evidence that he 
was engaged with people at the Kuliyat al Fiqh or somewhere like that, which I, I mean that would have been interesting. But I I remember like a long time ago we were having dinner at um, you know the old Masgouf in in, um, in Knightsbridge. Um, there was some rich Iraqi there who was paying for it, um, and so. Um, um, you know, the, the Iraqis always wanted to ask him about Baghdad, but he didn't really want to talk very much about that. Uh, and mainly because I think most people from that period are just not alive. Um, and th those who were sitting around the table were too young to, to really know. So, uh, But just adding to that, um, so his, his two years in Baghdad were after his PhD, and in which he mentions that he didn't want to stay there. So that reluctant, like why he, he couldn't explore, because he wasn't so much in, in, in conformity of, of saying more in Baghdad. But about his stay in Egypt, in Cairo, we know that he had connection with Hassan Abbas and like, you know, likes of scholars. But for Baghdad, yeah, we don't have it any. Was, it was in the, the monarchy. It was before the, it was before 58. Um, yeah, hence, hence the question, because yeah, actually yeah. it was a, a good period following the Second World War. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was so still the with the monarchy. And um, yeah, so at that point, yeah, so he had been working on the Qarameter. Yeah, that's, that's correct, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll end there. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن عليا ولي الله أشهد أن عليا ولي الله حي على الصلاة الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح على خير العمل حي على خير العمل الله أكبر لا إله إلا 
وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين